As a journalist, I've been on the road 40 years, 70 or so countries, all the continents, too many wars and revolutions. I've got packing down to a fine art. I was off to a huge, lonely country I'd never had a chance to see. Partly because not much newsworthy ever seemed to happen there. Until now. I was taking the last train to go right across Canada. The Canadian Railway runs from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific, 4,000 miles of iron road that spans 10 provinces, five time zones, swamps, mountains, and frozen desert. It's a trip I've always wanted to make. And then I heard it was closing down for good. It was now or never. The railway had built this country and tied it together from sea to frigid sea. happened to Canada when it disappeared. I began my journey in the Atlantic fishing town of Sydney, Nova Scotia. I've always been rather intrigued by this Sydney because I come from the other Sydney, halfway around the world. Where are you from? Sydney. You're from Sydney in the first time you're in Canada? Correct. The real uh, Sydney. Oh, Sydney, Australia. You got it. You got it. <laughs> Half our mile. Oh, you're down place. under. Exactly. <laughs> you're, down, you're down there, boy. You want a card? Okay. Got it. Got it? Thanks, George. Thanks. You're welcome. Lot. And the railway station's down that way. Yeah, down that way. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, buddy. That fish was fresh then, but it's a long way across Canada. Tactfully, I dropped it off at the hotel and collected my baggage. Ladies and gentlemen, Via Rail Canada's rail liner for North Sydney. Sydney Mines, Port Hawkesbury, New Not Glasgow, many tourists take Stellar, this train. Toronto, Atlantic Canada is Halifax, economically dying. And board. sadly, its principal exports seem to be people heading west to look for work. Okay, guys. You come to Vancouver? Vancouver, all the way, sir, yep. Good, good, good. Board, up to the left. Smoking okay, down, smoking back down from the wall. And even sadder are some of the people who stay behind. All aboard! So I joined the Migration West from which many passengers never come back. people seem haunted by the sadness of saying goodbye to the sea.
Oh, Murray's my name. Murray. My name is Bernice. Oh, hello, Bernice. Hi. Hello. How are you? How are you? And where do you come from? I come from Newfoundland. Oh. Trains are great for meeting people. I soon met Bernice from Newfoundland, a Canadian island province they call The Rock. I was her first Australia. In fact, Bernice had only left her island home for the first time a few years ago. When I got off the rack, when I left the rack, I was, I was 33 years old when I left the rack. For the first time? Yeah. I used to think about it when I was small. What was the outside world like? What was the other places like, right? I was only small, I never traveled, right? You know, are the people different from where I come from, where I'm at, right? What about this train? You've been on this one before. No, this is my first time on the train. First time on the train? Really? Well, how do you like it? I think it's great. It's beautiful. It sees yeah, all the trees. you got a great view, don't you? It is gorgeous, <laughs> I tell you. The birch trees and the poplar trees, that's the most trees that ever blows in the woods. They're the ones that shows up Mother's nature. Mm. It does. And the maple trees, I forgot that. Yes, there's a lot of maple trees around here. I've already noticed that, yeah. You did, I. So now? Now, this is all new to me, you see. I haven't seen a maple tree before. You never I mean, except from on the flag, there's a maple leaf. But I've never you seen never a seen tree. a maple tree? I wasn't sure know. what they looked like. You don't know what you're missing, my dear. This train was only a small branch line, an eight-hour run that connected up with the main Trans-Canada line. It collected people in villages along the way, taking them to Halifax, Montreal, Toronto, the big world around the bend. Many of these young people were out of work. Their region is poor and getting poorer, partly because the fishing industry is dying. Codfish jigging, that's what they're doing. That's what's nice, mother, codfish jigging. I used to do that. Yeah, yeah it's so nice when you get some on a jigger. <laughs> when you hook some, I used to get them like that. My friend took me out one time in the boat. to be going back to work in Toronto, Canada's biggest city. But I was wrong. There's a lot of people up there, a lot of hustle and bustle. I didn't like it at all. You know, your friends are when you're home. Like, in the community at home, there's, oh, you can go 20, ma 20 miles easy around the whole place, and everybody's your friend. Up there, you don't, you don't know anybody that's even next door. It's totally different. Everybody's out for themselves up there. They just look after themselves. I don't know. The people that goes away from Newfoundland, I don't think they should have to go away. No, I think that's a crime. There's no jobs. They gotta go away. They gotta bar up their homes, and they gotta go up there to make a living. So Enough to get around the plan and he comes back and that's it and then they gotta go back again. I figure it's years to come, nobody is gonna be in here. It's gonna be a ghost town. Oh, 
This train doesn't run anymore. Soon after my trip, it closed. It was time to start a little background reading. Coming up was my first stop and my first Canadian city, the famous old naval port of Halifax. miles covered, only 3,500 to go. <laughs> Berenice had got off one stop earlier, but I'd made another new friend. His name was Tom Gallant, a one-time singer who's now a full-time sailor. He invited me aboard once I'd looked around Halifax. here certainly haven't forgotten where they came from. Halifax is the capital of Nova Scotia, which means New Scotland. This was British North America. And at first sight it still looked to me more British than North America. Canada only got its own maple leaf flag 25 years ago, and some places still don't seem to have heard about it. The British war against their rebellious American colonies was fought from Halifax. Here they don't seem all that pleased that George Washington won. I could see a Canadian identity was emerging here, but slowly, almost reluctantly. Perhaps it's because Nova Scotians were comfortable with the British Empire. In fact, geographies put them a lot closer to Britain than they are to the far-off provinces of Western Canada. Life in Halifax isn't all fish and chips. I'd stumbled on the Autumn Mardi Gras, a citywide bash that takes over the whole of downtown. Some local natives had decided on dinner. Me. Even a Halifax street party has a certain British respectability. They say that Canada was founded on the values of peace, law and order, values that came from Britain. I could still see that law-abiding legacy. Among 70,000 all-night revelers, only one minor crime was reported, an inept mugger who was arrested the next day. Next morning, I dropped in on the nearby town of Lunenburg to take up my invitation to go sailing. My friend Tom had found a freedom rare in Atlantic Canada, the freedom to be able to stay at home. Born here in Nova Scotia, he'd moved to Toronto and become a successful entertainer. Then he gave it all up to come back to the sea. Today, Tom's scratching out a living as a part-time skipper leading tourist cruisers. He's turned his back on the good life for what he thinks is a better one. I've done a bit of sailing myself. I once crossed the Atlantic alone, so I know a few of the old seafaring traditions. Right. Oh, well, Murray, speaking of old traditions and traditions, when we go to sea out here, we take one of these bottles of this here stuff, yeah. and we give a drink to the old man. There you go, buddy. Stay out there. 
And then we have one each ourselves. To help. To help. Welcome aboard. Mm. That's, that's a good, that's a, yeah. it's a nice blend, isn't it? It's a good week. This is uh, rum drinking is a big thing in Nova Scotia, right? It's the national alternative. Alternative to what? To everything. I say, yeah. To hell with it. Let's get drunk. Yeah. When I sail back here, and we're coming into Lunenburg, the last six hours coming in, I'm in a state of ecstasy that's almost impossible to hold inside my heart, you know, it's so strong. And and it's there's no, I, I don't think there is any reason for it. It's just where I belong. You're coming home. It's where I belong. The dream of everybody in Toronto is to move to New York or Los Angeles and be a star. Yeah. The dream of everybody in Nova Scotia is to be able to afford to stay here. That's the difference. Unlike sailboats, trains run on timetables. And the way the skipper was passing around the rum, I was going to have a hard time catching my train. Oh, Shenandoah, I long to hear you. Oh. On the track. Now I joined the main line, the transcontinental train to Montreal that was part of the Canadian railway legend. Up until the 1950s, this was one of the world's most glamorous trains. In those days, the jet set was the train set. A romantic world of sleeping cars and chance encounters. Trains have attractions that aeroplanes don't. Like putting your head out of the window. And if you're learning to count, you can count telephone poles. Lots of scenery, and there's really only one place to view it from that indispensable Canadian invention, the dome car. It's ideal for seeing a country where practically everyone seems to have been born within the sound of a train whistle. Okay, where, where? All right, she wants to see it's, my right, it's over there. There it is, right over yeah, there. Over there. There it is. You can yeah. see it. My house, the house I was born, the house I was born in. <laughs> she knows where it is, right over there. Across, across at the base of the, of the hill. This railway was the great Canadian dream, an iron road driven through an impossible wilderness, and it's much celebrated in Canadian myth and music. There was a time in this fair land when the railroad did not run, when the wild majestic mountains stood alone against the sun. Long before the white man and long before the wheel, when the green dark forest was too silent to be real, Many countries built railways. Canada may be the only one built by a railway. The train welded Canada together, a steel wedding band uniting the people of the second great nation of North America. 
The border between Canada and the United States is the world's longest undefended frontier. But psychologically, Canada was defended by a railway that stretched right along the border, pulling people east and west and barring the way south. Many Canadians were once Americans who fled the American Revolution. They wanted to build a second America that would stay loyal to the British Crown. The railway was to be their main line of defence, holding together a new country which combined the boots and Stetson of the American cowboy with the security of the British red coat. I was now entering the province of New Brunswick, settled by American refugees passionately loyal to the British Empire, as I learned from a young man I met on the train. You've got to remember, a lot of Canadians were on the opposite side of the American Revolution to the United Empire loyalists, right. and there's a lot of those in Ontario, a lot of people were dissatisfied. And you think that there's still the feeling of the Empire loyalists strong in Canada? I think damn right, sir. They think, you know, the American Revolution was a mistake. Yeah. We didn't have the violence, we didn't have the bloodshed, and uh, we've achieved uh, political independence as much as they have, and uh, we didn't have to go through all the uh, violence and uh, chaos at the end. We never fought a civil war in this country yet, and hopefully we never will. So maybe the revolution was a bad idea? I think the American Revolution was a mistake. You have two sides to a revolution. You have those people who want change, and you have people who don't want change. And obviously the then Empire loyalists and Canadians that are now were the people that uh, were the conservatives in that part of the revolution. They wanted to maintain the status quo. Yeah, I think basically Canadians are a pretty conservative people. Are you personally conservative? I don't mean politically, I mean in your Oh, yeah, very conservative. You are? That's part of being Canadian, yeah. through the wilderness called for some entertainment and the passengers supplied it. The Canadian enthusiasm is not of the knee-slapping variety. Canadian train, the United States is never far away. In fact, it's right outside the window. The Canadian tracks take a shortcut through the American state of Maine, which juts into Canada between Halifax and Montreal, and a U.S. border guard gets on the Canadian train. Guard's job is to make sure all the doors are locked and sealed shut. Just in case some reckless Canadian should suddenly fling himself off the train in pursuit of the American dream just outside the window. first night on the train and I was curious to try out the Canadian sleeping car. As it happens it's a Canadian invention dating back to 1857 and not much changed since those days. Next morning, Montreal, Canada's most cosmopolitan city. Time for my first sortie into Canadian big city life. It's the world's second largest French-speaking city, famous for sharp dresses and chic coiffure. A big
big, sophisticated town where, I've been warned, an immaculate toilette is de rigueur. At first glance, this could be the skyline of any big North American city. Two million people and four million cars. This is the province of Quebec, the last remaining stronghold of French in North America. People here just don't speak the same language. In fact, I was surprised to discover that for over a decade, it's been the law of the province of Quebec that all outdoor signs must be in French only. These are real French fries. Signs in English are outlawed, right down to the last apostrophe. What could be more American than a marathon? But the crowd was cheering them on in French. I heard that many Quebecers were demanding independence under their own flag. They're led by the Parti Québécois, a movement striving to separate from Canada. But I had to come here to discover just how deep and widespread Quebec nationalism runs. No, it's not really for politics. It's like, um, it's a symbol, symbol, I don't know how to say that, symbol. Symbol. Okay, exactly. a symbol. Um, it's our. Oh yeah. I choose for me. The Parti du Québec. It's the Parti Québécois. It's uh, because we we want the independence for the, the Quebec. We want to be a, a, a country. Wouldn't that cut Canada in half? Yes, but we, we are not. We don't. I I I'm. I don't live in Canada. I live in Quebec. Yeah. For me, it's. It's the, it's, it's my, my country is Quebec, it's not Canada. To brush up on my Quebec history, I dropped in on Quebec City, the capital of the province, just down the line from Montreal. Here, 95% of the population speaks French, a last remnant of the days when the French Empire ruled two-thirds of North America. This place reminded me of the rainy province of Brittany in France, because long ago that's where most French Quebecers came from. You don't really feel you're in North America here. You're either in Montmartre or in Hollywood. But Quebec isn't just famous for French architecture. The future of all North America was decided here, on one famous battlefield. And there's only one way to see it. But before I get too far, the date of Quebec City, 1608. Yeah. Found by Samuel de Champlain. Look at these houses down in here now, the average in the 200 years. Really? This is old Quebec. Hello, how are you? Mademoiselle, the battle took place, it was uh, 13 of September, 1759. That's when they fought the French and British. The battlefield looks more like a park today. But it was here that the French Marquis de Montcalm lost the battle and his life to British General James Wolfe. How the British did it come up the river, see? Yeah. Yet the British didn't really win either. With the French threat gone, the American colonies no longer needed British protection, and so they launched their revolution. In a sense, both the United States and Canada were born here, while another nation died, the Empire of New France. 
Quebec City, would have been its Washington. Perhaps that's why French Canadians are so determined to defend their language and culture in their corner of the world. In a way, the Battle of Quebec has never ended. Sometimes I get real upset and I get real but you, sick, you, you know. Basically, we'd like another beer. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I would like another beer. This is about the only thing we have. Last night in Quebec, I ran into two Quebec newspaper columnists. English columnist Nick Aftermar and French columnist Gerald Leblanc. 200 years after the battle was over, they were still fighting it. Deep down, you don't agree, you don't agree deep down that it's, it's not, we cannot take that for granted, being a French society in North America. You have to kind of help, help it and help it a lot. You don't accept that deep down. Who is you? Uh, the English-speaking people in Montreal. We accept being a minority, but we'd like to, like all minorities, we'd like to be accepted. And it's very hard to think that we're respected or accepted when, when, when you find that our, our, um, our language on public display on a sign is as, uh, as poisonous to the majority collective society as, uh, as the AIDS virus is. You know, I mean, that's the way we're made to feel. Are we talking about language or are we talking about politics? Who's the boss? Talking about, yeah, power. We're power. Who's power. the boss? Yeah, right. Uh, okay, now we're discussing who's the boss in Canada or who's the boss in Quebec. Well, I don't know. Sometimes I think, you know, the old adage, I don't know if you heard about Canada, they said Canada was a very lucky country that we had access to uh, French culture, American know how, and British politics. And we ended up with American culture, British know how, and French politics. <laughs> no, that's good. So who won the Battle of Quebec? To an old war correspondent like me, the conflict seemed too friendly to be serious. French Canadians seem to have flourished here as if they'd won the Battle of Quebec. And Canada has gained a unique dual culture that no other country has. I felt very much at home in both parts of Canada. I wish they'd stop fighting that old battle because both sides have too much to lose. Another day, another train. This is Canada's ritziest train, heading to Canada's glitziest city, Toronto. They even pass out free televisions. Yes, good morning. It's Rita Martineau. May I speak to the end of here, please? Thank you. Listen, uh, the train is behind, uh, is late, okay? Uh, I'll be arriving around... These people are on their way to work five hours away in a train that thinks it's an airplane. Would you like some orange juice? And predictably, this is the train that's expected to survive and get even glitzier when the rest of the train system is gone. This is to start you off. Everything here feels rather American, and that seems to trouble some Canadians. They wonder why they can't have a strong Canadian identity to match that of their neighbor on the other side of the border. There are some differences that the Canadians feel between themselves and Americans, but I think part of our, our concern about Americanism is that we really want to be different. We haven't quite been able to define what that difference is. It's always difficult when you're at some international function and every country is supposed to sing a song or do a dance which represents their nationality. Canadians always have a problem. I mean, they can't do a square dance. That's as American as Canadian. So we end up singing Alouette, most of us who don't speak French. But beyond singing Alouette, we find it a little difficult to say, now, there's a Canadian song, or there's a Canadian dance, or uh, there's a Canadian piece of, uh, piece of theater. I was off to meet Canada's foremost railway authority, Pierre Burton, author of many books on the railway he calls The National Dream. Burton lives in Toronto, 
It was a small town on Lake Ontario with only 1,600 people when the railway was built. Now it boasts over 3 million. This is a train for people in a hurry. They just can't wait to get to the office. I'd arranged to meet author Pierre Burton in Toronto's Union Station. He's a big man who took me on a tour of an enormous station that looked more like a cathedral. It's based on romance. It's based on the great Canadian myth. Think of this way. Every country has, a, has an epic story in their background, which they look up. The Spanish Armada, the French Revolution storming the Bastille, the American Revolution, the Vortrek, and the Long March. We're the only one in which there's no blood. We're the only country in the world in which our great mythic endeavor is the building of a railway. So there's a kind of a mythical or almost religious quality about the railway then? Yeah, well, look at this building. This it looks is a like temple. a temple, yeah. It, or it, it, this is based on the Roman baths of Caracalla, they tell me. It is a temple, as all Canadian major railway stations are, because there is a religion about railways, or at least, as you say, a myth. The Canadians have a different attitude towards railways than most people in the world because, not only because the railways started the country, but because the country is shaped like a railway. I mean, 90% of our people live within 200 miles of yep. the border. So what we are, a country, for a population point of view, 4,000 miles long, 200 miles thick, with an archipelago of population islands dispersed between enormous barriers, mm -hmm. the, the angry ocean, the white-plumed mountains, the vast Canadian shield, a thousand miles of rock and muskie, the psychological barrier of Quebec. So in this country, transportation and communication are terribly, terribly important and romantic. The train may be romantic, but Toronto certainly isn't. It seemed to be a bad case of the North American edifice complex. There's that flag again. This is where the money came from to build the railway. An old-fashioned puritanical town where, as the Canadian joke goes, people say, thank God it's Monday. Yet I could see that the toil of doer Torontonians has created the most Canadian of cities, a tolerant, hard-working town that lets anyone who shares its values share its prosperity. Toronto made me wonder whether Canadians haven't already found their long-sought identity in the many identities they've been able to tolerate without crushing. <laughs> Cynthia is the owner of a small Toronto store. school here but I don't really know who is a Canadian so when I'm in Toronto I'm a Canadian and when I'm in Jamaica I'm a Jamaican I can't figure this out who is a Canadian I used to hear they say the Indians yeah now you see the whites they say they are Canadian so who is the Canadian I guess anybody who lives here is a Canadian well I'm a Canadian okay I see Next day, I caught up with the Trans-Canadian Line just outside Toronto, joined by some more picturesque passengers. They were members of the Amish sect, out on a weekend trip and exercising their right of free song. A 
ahead of me was some of the most spectacular scenery and some of the most forbidding terrain to face the railway builders. I just read about a Canadian Prime Minister who said, people came to Canada to escape history, only to find themselves overwhelmed by geography. This track was the bravest decision in the railway's history. The easy route would have been to go south through the farmlands of the United States. To stay in Canada, they had to blast their way through the Canadian Shield, a thousand miles of the oldest, hardest rock in the world. There aren't many towns out here, so the big excitement is the sight of the train. School kids come out to wave, and the Amish throw them candy. Sign good morning to you. Yeah. And you know, it meant an awful lot to us because we feel that uh, a new morning is a blessing from God. Get, get that little red house. Get that little red house. Oh, you missed it. You gotta, you gotta get it far away. But you have to get it. Get that rock. <laughs> This is still a famous part of the line and it lures romantics from all over the world. I met a man who spent the whole day hanging out of the rear of the train, relishing the happy days when he worked on a railroad. out of solid rock four and a half billion years old. 30 foot snow drifts, temperatures of 50 below zero. I could tire just reading about how they built this line. We gotta lay down the tracks and tear up the trails. Open your heart, let the life blood flow. Gotta get on our way, cause we're moving too slow. Bring in the workers and bring up the rails. We gotta lay down the tracks and tear up the trails. Open your heart, let the life blood flow. Gotta get on our way, cause we're moving too slow. Get on our way, cause we're moving too slow. This was a stunning achievement, penetrating yet another barrier isolating Canadians from each other and opening up a harshly beautiful landscape. What's wrong? Eh? Well, the whole CTC is giving them problems. It was a good thing I saw it when I did, because the train I was on isn't running anymore. The Canadian government says passenger service isn't worth subsidizing when most people are in a hurry and prefer to fly or drive. So these slightly faded, elegant stainless steel cars are being shunted off to the retirement yard. Yet perhaps the government calculations overlooked another purpose of the train. It was a magic carpet of discovery for generations of Canadians. So I did it once and I really liked it and I've come back and I've told all my friends about it and I've told Anna about it too and I told her when we were taking this trip, I said, Anna, 
we're going to take the train. It's beautiful, you have to see it. Okay. Just the differences, just the, the massive differences in one country. You know, and all you do is just draw a, take this train straight along and you'll see the variety. You know? The accommodations vary. The room service is acceptable, if you do it yourself. And the berths are a snug fit. Yet, as I turned in for the night to the soothing click of the rails, I had a nagging thought. What happens to Canada when the train that built the country stops running? I expected to see snow in Canada, but not in early autumn. for fine dining. Though it's hard to have table manners to match. <laughs> Not so easy. <laughs> Meals are still cooked the old-fashioned way. They've obviously never heard of microwaves here. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Hello, hello. That's pretty good on this train. I thought I'd come and see how you do it. You yeah. balance yourself. You seem pretty naturally balanced. Well, after 26 years, you get the max of it. Yeah, right. I'm not that hot enough. But she's going to grab anyway. I suppose after your first million eggs, you get to I a real a, feeling for yeah, it. Yeah. I missed a few, though. <laughs> <laughs> like I say, you can't win them all. No. Doesn't matter if you're left handed, huh? Well, it doesn't matter, it's your left hand hand. <laughs> I'll try that out. Uh... Right. <laughs> I'm sorry, Annie. I've... My hand slipped. Well, that's all right. How far are you going? Uh, to Vancouver. Well, that's fine. You can come back and give me a hand a little later. Okay. On. <laughs> there we are. That's better, yeah, right? Now, well, let's clean this place up. Travelling through this wilderness, I couldn't help but wonder how the people who built the railway got out here without a railway. It's not surprising that the Canadian West was uninhabited until the railway found a way through. There are still no roads or towns out here, just the train track. And as I reached the halfway point of my voyage, here in the midst of the loneliest country on earth, I thought a modest celebration was in order. This is not wine-growing country, but I'd managed to get my hands on a bottle of Canada's answer to champagne. It was unpretentious, good preparation for the tough part of my journey still ahead. This was the last stop before I headed north, and my fellow travellers looked ready for adventure. We were leaving the city slickers of Toronto far behind. The only sign of civilization out here is this train. It's even got a singing baggage man, Bill Hoffmeister. This is a train and this is the tracks. Run and seas when all is well along the way. But it's not well at home. He got a call on the telephone. She 
place that I'll say where, but here's where I'm gonna stay. So his heart is breaking on the rear of the midnight train. He knows he's darling, ain't coming home again. Now it isn't easy being alone with all his pain. But he's the watchman on the rear midnight train. Wait, I know something about him. I'd survived the civilized parts of Canada. Now I was headed out into the wilds, north to the Arctic, west over the endless prairies to the Rocky Mountains and the sea. Pioneer country, opened up by the iron road that was soon to close down. This was my last chance to see it. Yeah. <laughs>